All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, just a super quick reminder that today and tomorrow is your pair of days to complete test two on chapter two, sections 2.1 through 2.8. You have a PDF review in Canvas. You have a My Math Lab review. I know it says posted later, but I wrote that a week ago. So obviously uh, that review has been posted, whether you want to just try something more on your own or have the kind of guided steps along the way, that is up to you. <clears throat> Remember the reviews do not count for or against you, but they are similar to the tests and very helpful. Remember that it's a two hour test, no notes, no books, no calculators. This is supposed to just be all in your brain. And that when you finish it within 15 minutes, you're supposed to take pictures of your work and submit it in Canvas. So I do have that spot set up. I believe it's set up correctly. I triple checked it this time because I know I had it goofed uh, the first like half hour it was up or whatever last time. So everything with test two today and tomorrow, if you don't finish it by 11.59 p.m. tomorrow, then you will earn a zero for test two unless you have a doctor's note, court note, anything like that that says you have a legitimate reason to have missed the exam. But I will not just sit, take an email and say, hey, I forgot about it. You missed the test then. Responsibilities are important. And with that being said, let's not waste any time. Let's dive right back into 3.1, which were all about graphing quadratics. That was our goal to graph parabolas but in a more specific way, in a better way. Back in chapter two, we were just kind of sketching them. That was the word I preferred, where we only plotted the vertex point, and then we made it point up or down based on whether it was reflected vertically or not. Here, we're trying to make a more accurate graph. <clears throat> so we said, in order to plot a parabola accurately, you need at least three points. Quite often we end up with four and we're gonna plot four if we get four, but we do need at least three. Sometimes we end up in a situation where we only find two, and then what we have to do is find an additional point by symmetry or just plugging in a random X value, not necessarily random X value, you could choose it specifically, but just another X value of which you would have billions of choices. So we said that we're gonna call the vertex H comma K, uh, these letter choices are arbitrary, but that's what we're going to go with. Some people use X1 and Y1 still. That's perfectly fine. We talked about the vertex form of a parabola in that the awesomeness of the vertex form is that you can tell what the vertex is in the vertex form. It's this number and this number with their signs being opposite for the H and the same for the K. This is also known as standard form, and I don't really like calling it standard form because I also introduced you to general form down here, which standard in general, I mean, I can see how anybody would miss, uh, would misname, oh, this is the standard form and the other is the general form. It, there's no real reason to call one or the other standard or general. That's why I like calling that first form vertex form, because then at least you know something about it. You can tell, hey, if I'm in vertex form, I can look at it and see the vertex when I'm in this other form, which is quite honestly how I refer to it, <laughs> the non-vertex form, you can't just look at this and tell me what the x and y coordinates of the vertex are. You have to use a formula or complete the square. And again, I'm not going to introduce the technique of completing the square for this. Uh, it's very similar to what we did in the past. It's just the whole adding to both sides becomes adding and subtracting on the same side. This number right here, if it's not a one, it screws everything up. Um, you have to account for it in ways. So it's just, it's a little bit of a pain. It works, but the formula works too. So I say we go with the easier thing. And also you might say, well, this is just an arbitrary formula. And Mr. Beckner, you say you don't like arbitrary formulas. Well, it's not really arbitrary because I pointed out <laughs> it was already in the quadratic formula. It was this section. And there is a reason for that. that this has everything to do with that symmetry factor, where if you go left or right and you'll have the same amount, then you'll have the same height. So we did some examples with the vertex form. We found the vertex. We said whether it opened up or down. We found the x-intercepts by setting the function equal to zero. We found the y-intercept by finding f of zero. I said that this theme of finding all intercepts is gonna keep going and going and going for the rest of the semester, and that you do have to know which one is named which. If you get the names backwards, you will end up losing points in homework and maybe even on a test. So please be careful, please understand the names. All right, the most interesting problem we had was one where 
uh, there were no X intercepts, these were imaginary. So we ended up using the Y intercept and we said, well, that's four units away from the axis of symmetry. So there's another point, also four units, but the other direction away from the axis of symmetry. So that's the symmetry argument that I said is, that makes it really easy to find another, uh, another point. And you could plug in negative eight and it would turn out to be 18 if you plugged in negative eight here. If you made that a negative eight, you would get positive 18 out of this at the end of the day. I think I talked that through. All right, so then we got to the general form. We had the formula for H, the X coordinate. We said to find the Y coordinate, which is K. We just plug in the X coordinate. And we did one of these, and it was a little more annoying because the vertex was a fraction, but it wasn't the end of the world. So now we are going to do more of those. And I am looking at the wrong page. Here we go, B, whoops. <laughs> that button on the pen does all kinds of weird things. I can never predict what it's gonna do next. Sometimes it erases, sometimes it moves things. It's weird, it's wacky, keeps me on my toes. F of X equals negative X squared minus two X plus one. Hmm. So this is the general form instead of the standard form, or what, is I, what I like to call it is the non-vertex form. But I know a lot of people are used to this being the more generalized polynomial form where they're separated, there's no parentheses. This looks like it would be factored. And we try to factor it actually <laughs> in the process of solving some of these details. But anyways, uh, I said it's easiest if you go ahead and identify what your A are, which in this case, your A is negative one, your B is negative two, and your C is positive one. Now, I'm going to put some little asterisks, asterisks next to this, and I'm going to come back to it, uh, ultimately. I'm going, to, I'm going to relabel the A, B, and Cs is what I'm getting to. All right, so since the A is negative, we know this opens down. That was one of the things, and we said out of that list of four or five things we got to do, find the intercepts, talk about how it opens, additional points if needed, vertex. You can do those in any order. It's just a list of things to get done, not in a particular order. There's no PEMDAS here. There's no order of operations. All right, so once we know how this opens up, we can find the vertex. So when we go to the, do the V, which I'm calling V for vertex, H is negative B over 2A negative b, so that's negative, negative 2, over 2a, which is 2 times negative 1. Three negatives makes a single negative ultimately, and that's 2 divided by 2, which is 1. So negative 1 is the x coordinate of the vertex. <clears throat> that is the x value at which if you go left and you have a specific height, you can go right and you'd have the same specific height, as long as you're going left and right the same amount. K, we find by plugging in this value. <clears throat> All right, so F of negative one. Now you have got to be careful. This negative, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> this negative messes up so many students because they say, oh, that's a negative, that's a negative, they cancel. Nope. So this is gonna be, that's the negative for the outside. Now I'm plugging in a negative, so I gotta wrap it in a parentheses, and there's my negative one that I plug in. See again, this negative one is this negative one. This negative outside is this negative outside. Keep your ducks in a row. All right, then the minus two X becomes minus two times negative one, then the plus one. Now PEMDAS, 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 you do not, cancel these two negatives right here. This is a negative squared, which makes that a positive, but there's still a negative outside, which makes that a negative one. See, the, the little red thing I'm circling is, I'm saying that this negative one squared is this positive one. This negative outside stays the negative outside. Be careful, that's where people mess up. Then a plus two, plus one, which ends up being a positive two. So our vertex as a coordinate pair is negative one comma positive two. Now we can find our x-intercepts and our y-intercepts. 
going to definitely need some more space here. So I like to do the x-intercept first. x-intercept, intercepts, could be plural, could be singular, could be none. And that's where we take the original function, which was negative x squared minus 2x plus 1. And we're setting, e setting it equal to 0. We're making the whole function equal to 0. That's what I've done. I just put the 0 on the right-hand side. Doesn't matter. Now, this has a negative leading term, which makes factoring a little more complicated. So here's what I'm going to suggest. If you try to factor this, even if you try and do the quadratic formula right out of the gate, when the a is negative, it messes a lot of things up because you're going to have this plus or minus thing in the top, and then you have your 2a in the bottom. But with the a negative, that makes the bottom negative. So you have your plus or minus, blah, 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 and then over some negative number. We don't like negatives being left in a denominator, which means you need to bring it to the front or distribute it. And when you distribute it to this plus or minus, it doesn't actually change it. But a lot of people think that it should, but it doesn't because the plus or minus symbol just represents both as a possibility, not a specific order until you get to trigonometry. So what I'm saying is we don't like a negative leading coefficient for factoring or the quadratic formula. Let's, so let's multiply both sides a negative one to fix the a, to make it positive. So I'm taking negative one times the left side and negative one times the right side. Now, this is not the only way to get this job done. You could also divide both sides by negative one, or you could just move everything to the other side by adding x squared and adding two x and then subtracting one on both sides. That's three different ways to get this task done. And once you do that, you'll have positive x squared plus 2x minus 1 equals 0. Now, if you try and factor this, the negative 1, the only factor pairs are 1 and 1. And you might say, oh, well, 1 and 1 added 2. But they're supposed to subtract to 2. 1 minus 1 is 0. So this is not factorable. It's prime, which means we need to complete the square or use the quadratic formula. I'm going with the quadratic formula. And now my a, b, and c are positive 1, positive 2, and negative 1. Just the opposites of the original a, b's, and c's. You will get the exact same solutions no matter which a, b, and c you use. The bottom one is significantly easier. I've talked about why the first version is more complicated. I'm not going to show that work in the interest of time, though. This formula. Again, if you're in a math class, you do not get to forget this. Negative b, so negative 2, plus or minus, big square root. b squared, which is 2 squared, minus 4ac, so 4 times 1 times negative 1. Then all over 2a, which is 2 times 1. Keep going, so that's negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 4 plus 4 all over 2. Watch your signs. This negative and this negative do cancel each other out. 4 plus 4 is 8, so that's negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 8 all over 2. Now, we don't know the square root of 8 <clears throat> off the top of our head, so this is not going to be a rational solution. It's not going to be like 5 or 3 halves or whole numbers or fractions are out. It's going to be stuck with a square root or an i, not an i, obviously. But this is not good enough. If you say the, this is the x value of the intercepts, that's wrong because we can simplify the square root of 8. So remember, the square root of 8, you can write as the square root of 4 times 2, which becomes 2 square root of 2. This 4, we know the square root of, so we pop it out. If you're going on to trig or if you're going on to calculus, guess what? You don't get to forget that. Here's the real beauty. Once you pull that 2 out, you got a 2 in the top, 2 in the top, 2 in the bottom. There's a factor of 2 everywhere, so you can actually cancel those out. You can say 2 goes into a negative 2 once, into 2 once, and into 2 once. If that 2 had not been there, we couldn't have done this. <clears throat> so you cannot cancel these 2s. You cannot cancel those as a fraction with an extra plus or minus. But here you can. 
I said I don't like leaving the cancellation there. So that just becomes negative one plus or minus the square root of two. With a one in the bottom, we don't need to write it. So our x-intercepts are negative one plus square root of two comma zero. Remember the y-coordinate is zero. We plugged that in to begin with. We made the function zero. That's the y-value. And negative one minus square root of two comma zero. <clears throat> Now, if I tell you there's no calculator allowed on this test, which spoilers I won't, that would make this a little more complicated to figure out exactly where to plot these. However, chapter three is where I loosen up those rules and I say, all right, you're finally allowed to, do, to use a calculator. <clears throat> and I have various reasons for that. First of all, you may end up having to plot points with square roots in them, so you need to pull out your calculator and figure out, well, what is this square root of two? What is negative one plus this square root of two? So that's one of the many reasons we start allowing calculators at this point. So FYI, the square root of two is, let's just call that about 1.4. So the square root of two is approximately, that's what this means, 1.4, just round it to one decimal place. So this is about negative one plus, 1.4, which would be positive 0.4. This is negative 1 minus 1.4, which would be negative 2.4. So I just want to have these be approximations <clears throat> because when I go to graph, that's going to help me graph. The negative 1 plus square root of 2 is the actual answer. Do not put the intercepts being what I'm about to write in my math lab. That's wrong. These are the x-intercepts, but we're going to need approximations for plotting them. <clears throat> Okay, hold on a second. So the x-intercepts are about, again, negative 1 plus 1.4 is 0.4, so 0.4 comma 0, and negative 1 minus 1.4 is negative 2.4 comma 0. Again, approximately, let's even, instead of using the colon, use the approximate symbol there. Oops, too much. There we go. So there are two points. Now we can do our y-intercept finally. The y-intercept is where we find f of zero. And we do have to go back to the original function. We cannot use the one where we move things because when we move things, we had made this part a zero. We can't move things if it's not zero. So we're going back to the negative x squared minus 2x plus 1. Again, negative x squared minus 2x plus 1. So that's negative 0 squared minus 2 times 0 plus 1, which I think is very obviously 1. So our y-intercept is 0 comma 1. Now let's see, what are all the things we need? We need to know how this opens, which we said it opens down. We need our vertex which we got, and then we need all of our intercepts, which we just got two x-intercepts and a y-intercept. This is a best, best case scenario. Yeah, it's a little annoying because of the, the radicals and the approximation and all that jazz, but this is better than when we have imaginary solutions because then we have to use symmetry to find an extra point, generally speaking. And if your vertex was also your x-intercept, that's actually, I'm sorry, your y-intercept, that's your worst case scenario because then you just got to come up with a bunch of X numbers to plug in. All right. So let's get the graph here. Come on, hold on a second. Sorry about that, my, <laughs> my dog was under me and his allergies were just causing him to scratch up a storm and he was hitting me over and over and over. Nobody, you gotta move. Hey, hold on. Yeah, the fun of teaching at home. All right, so. Vertex, 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 negative one comma two. So that's left one, up two. 
So here is our vertex point. Like I said, you can put a little V next to this if you're doing it by hand so that you can remember that, that, that that's where it's gonna do this or the other direction, which we know it opens down, so it better be the other direction. One, one, two. Then we had our y-intercept is still here at zero comma one, so that's right here. Then we had our x-intercepts, which were 0.4 comma zero and negative 2.4 comma zero. It's gonna be really difficult to go four tenths to the right doing this by hand. So I'm just gonna say 0.4 is really close to 0.5, so I'll go a half to the right, and negative 2.4 is close to negative 2.5, so I'll go two and a half to the left. So about a half to the right and two and a half to the left. So if this is one, there's about halfway to the right. Negative one, negative two, negative three. So if this is negative three, here's about halfway between negative two and negative three. <clears throat> and then we just connect and extend. Something like that, but you don't stop, you keep on going. And remember that this thing gets tighter and tighter as you keep moving up or keep moving down. So there is our graph. <coughs> Remember in homework and tests, sometimes we ask for the axis of symmetry, sometimes we don't. So if I did not ask for the axis of symmetry, you would stop here. If I did, then you would have to draw a vertical dotted line splitting this thing in half. And then somewhere you would say that your axis of symmetry is, well, that goes through negative one as an x value. So you say, oh, negative one. And then you get it wrong because the axis of symmetry is a vertical line. Vertical lines are of the form x equals a number because the x value is always negative one. This x value is 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 negative one. Pay attention, pay attention. It is going to suck if you get a problem wrong after doing all of this work because you did the axis of symmetry when you weren't supposed to or vice versa. And again, for a test, if you're showing work and you let me know, I can give you a lot of partial credit for it, but I'm not gonna do that on homework. Never, ever, ever. Okay. So we've done two examples of the vertex form or the uh, standard form. We did two examples in a non-vertex form, which is a general form. Now let's actually take this concept and go back to something we discussed in chapter two, <clears throat> which was the concept of local extrema, local maxes and local mints. Well, now we're not gonna just talk local, we're gonna talk more absolute. Absolute means there's only one. Now for these parabolas, these quadratics, they always look like this. That was terrible looking. They always look like this, or they always look like this. There's only two options for a y equals some kind of x squared. It's the only two options. And it should be ridiculously obvious which one of these has a maximum and which one of these has a minimum. Because this left one has arrows pointing up, there is no max. It goes up forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And ever meaning that it only has a min, and it's not a relative min, it is what we might call the absolute minimum. The min is right there. And again, we don't throw around the word absolute too often in here, but when you get into calculus, you will. For this one, vice versa, it goes down forever, so there is no min. It just has a highest point, which is the max. So that vertex point is the max. So if it points up, it's gonna have a minimum, and that minimum occurs at the vertex. If it points down, it's gonna have a maximum, and that maximum is the vertex. These are so ridiculously easy to understand if you paint a picture. Without the picture, if you're just trying to memorize things more arbitrarily, then people get them messed up all the time. So when we wanna find the max of the min, all you gotta do is find the vertex and know whether it points up or down. Boom, you're done. The vertex is the location of the max or min. If it points up, it's gonna have a min. If it points down, it's gonna have a max. Again, it's just direct logic. There is literally nothing complicated about that. Now, we talked about the language before when we were doing relative extrema, relative maxes and relative mins, or local maxes and local mins, all that is the same thing. 
the language is still the same here, that the max or min is located at the x coordinate, which we call h, and the max or min is the y coordinate. And if you get your language wrong, the answer is wrong. Again, there could be partial credit on a test with work shown, but homework, it's just wrong. You need to understand when we talk about increasing, decreasing locations of things, we're talking about the x value because a function can only use an x value once, but a function could potentially have a y value used over and over and over. So that's why we, we don't want to say the max or min is the y value because it could be seen over and over and over. We just want to say, hey, it happens here. That's the x value. The max or min is the y value. So again, that's the x value and the y value. Get the language right or lose points. That's all there is to it. This is not happening yet. Don't worry about that. We have to do example three still. That was weird. I'm gonna count how many times I say that is weird <laughs> using Word to do my work one day. Example three, I'm gonna type this up. Identify if the function has a max or a min. And say the max min is and where it's located at. And this is just going to be one problem f of x equals 2x squared minus 16x plus 30. All right, so you've got to know whether this is in vertex form or not in vertex form. If it looked like two parentheses x minus a number squared and then plus some number, that would be vertex form and then this number would be the h and then this number would be the k. But it's not in that form, so we've got our work cut out for us. Now in the real world, most people aren't prescribed a function in vertex form. They're usually given things in this format. So it would probably be advantageous to write that a is 2, b is negative 16, and c is 30. And then we just use the vertex formula, negative b over 2a, to find the x value. h equals negative b over 2a, so that's negative, negative 16 over 2 times 2, which is positive 16 over 4, which is 4. Then the k... You just plug that number in. Don't overthink it. So that would be 2 times 4 squared minus 16 times 4 plus 30. Let's see, 4 squared is 16. 16 times 2 is 32 minus 16 times 4 is 64, then plus 30. 32 and 30 make 62 minus 64 is negative 2. So that means our vertex is located at 4 comma negative 2. That is the location of what we call the extrema, the max or the min, the highest point or the lowest point, of which parabolas can only have one. See, before we were dealing with curves that looked like maybe this, and they could have several local maxes and several local mins. That's not what we're dealing with now. We're only dealing with one of those humps uh, whether they're a, uh, you know, a peak or a valley. Parabolas only can look like that. So we got to get the language right. We got to get the language right. So what are we going to say? Oh, shoot, that's going to be one line lower. I'm just going to handwrite it then. <laughs> that's all right. So we know it's a max or a min, right? Well, I actually haven't said that yet. The max or min is based on whether this graph points up or down. The A is positive 2, so it points up. The A is positive, so it points up. 
do yourself a favor, draw just at what that looks like, if it looks like this or if it looks like this. It's gonna help you out. It should look like this. So here's our vertex point. Again, I'm not actually plotting it. I was never asked to plot it. It's just a quick sketch. And we know that since the vertex has to be there, it absolutely has to be a, that's right, minimum. It has to be a min. So we say the min is the y value, and I'm doing these in a backwards order to keep you on your toes. I'm not going to say the location, then what it is. I'm going to say what it is, then the location. Then is the y value, which is negative 2, and it's located at or occurs at 4. Now, alternatively, what you could say is the min is y equals negative 2, and it's located at located at x equals 4. You can throw the x or y values in there if you prefer. That's a little more obvious. Now, in my math lab, be careful. You, you probably just want to be typing in the numbers, but in your notes, this would be helpful. Be very helpful. All right, so that's example three. When you're asked to find a max or a min, all you're finding is the vertex and then getting your language correct. There's no new math here at all, none. This application is so insanely important. If you wanna throw a ball in the air and find the, the peak height, if you know it's velocity and the direction you throw it and all that jazz, you can find out where its max height is gonna be. If you want to talk about economic uh, recessions and, and dips and, and peaks and all that stuff, you can talk about local extrema. Now, economic functions usually aren't modeled with quadratics in the real world, but when you have like a 100 level or 200 level economics class, you can. And then you can talk about, hey, we should probably peak, I mean, sorry, we should probably produce at the peak um, profitability. So you want to maximize your profit, you find out how many units you make to make that happen. Now in the real world, the ultimate challenge is finding the model, getting some mathematicians together to make the model, but that's not our problem for now. I feel like I hit back to one too many times. Nope, we're good. All right, so in the spirit of what I was just talking about, let's do some word problems. And we'll do a boring word problem first, and then we'll do one that is actually uh, quite helpful for some people. All right, so this one's boring, just plain math. Minimize the product of two numbers who have a difference of 10. And someone's going to say, oh, well, 0 and 10, because that product is 0. That's one way of thinking. But what about negative 1 and negative 9? I'm sorry, negative 1 and uh, positive 9. That product would be negative 9, which is smaller than 0. Ooh, didn't think about that, did you? It doesn't say two whole numbers. It says two numbers. So don't think you can just pull this out of thin air. <laughs> this is quite a challenge to pull out of thin air until you've done 40 or 50 of them and then you know the pattern and I can tell you the answer right now. And not just because I've done this particular example before, I could change that 10 to any number and I'll have the answer once again right now. But let's build up to that. Minimize the product of two numbers that have a difference of 10. This is actually, if you want to get technical about it, a system of equations. But we're going to find a way to avoid that process. That's not until chapter five. Even though you've seen systems of equations before, they were linear, and this is nonlinear. It, it just makes it a little weirder. So we want to minimize the product of two numbers. So let's just say the product equals. some number times some other number, maybe some x times y. So what I'm doing is I'm saying x here is the first number, and y here is the second number. Remember back in chapter one, I said to use your words to label things accurately. Don't just write the product as x times y. <laughs> write what x and y represent. And we want this product to be as small as possible. But we can't just say, oh, we'll make it negative a million times positive a million because then your product is negative a trillion. <laughs> so 
specifically, the difference of these numbers has to be 10. So it's something like 1 and 11, or 2 and 12, or 40 and 50, or negative uh, 100 and negative 90, or negative 100 and negative 110. So the x and the y have to be 10 apart. So in other words, the difference of, and the order of these doesn't matter, you can do x minus y or minus y, y minus x. It doesn't technically matter, it's just one of the subtractions has to come out to 10. Well, that difference is supposed to be 10, so I can go ahead and say 10 is equal to x minus y. This is what we call a secondary equation. I call it secondary because that's not the thing we're trying to maximize or minimize. This is known as an optimization problem. To find the best or worst scenario given some parameters. And optimization problems usually have two different equations. They'll have a product and a difference like this thing or you know something completely different. But you get the idea, there's two of them. We have a primary and a secondary. The primary is the thing that you want to actually find the best of, which in this case was a minimum. So this is our primary equation. This was our secondary equation. What you always wanna do with these is you wanna put the secondary into the primary. How do you do that? You solve it for x or y. I will say preferably x though. I'm sorry, preferably y. I just wrote that completely wrong. We preferably wanna solve it for y, that way when you, let's say this was just y equals blah, 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 blah. You're gonna take all of that and you're gonna plug it into the y of the primary equation so that there will only be x's in it. And then if you're trying to find a minimum, well, that means you're just trying to find a vertex or a maximum vertex. <clears throat> now, if you see a bunch of y's here, it still works, but it's gonna throw you off. I know it's gonna throw you off because it threw me off when I was learning it. So let's take that 10 equals x minus y. And we're gonna solve this for y in either one step or two steps. There's several different ways you can do this. Uh, you can subtract x and then divide both sides by negative one. I'm gonna do this a slightly different way because I know I've shown it that first way before. I'm just gonna add y to both sides, which will give me y plus 10 equals x. And then I'm gonna subtract 10 on both sides. will tell us y is equal to x minus 10. We're going to use this. We're going to take what y is now equivalent to. We just said y is just the first number minus 10. And we're going to plug it in to where we see a y in the primary. You solve the secondary and you plug it into the primary. How do you know which is which? The primary is the one that you don't know a number about and that you're trying to optimize. See, we knew what this difference was. We didn't know what the product is. All right, let's remove my Madden drawings. So now we plug this into the primary. All right, so that was the product is equal to x times x minus 10. Again, once again, I want to circle one last time. This is now what y represents. So in this equation, we wrote x minus 10 instead of y. That's how we got this. Well, we can distribute this. This is x squared minus 10x because being factored doesn't do anything for us when we're just trying to find the vertex. So now we find the vertex. Why do we find the vertex? because we're trying to find a max or a min. Maxes or mins occur at vertices of quadratics. This only has an x squared, which means it's quadratic. If it had an x cubed, this would not be the way we would handle things. It would be much more complicated. 
How do we find the vertex in this format? Negative b over 2a. So your a is 1, your b is negative 10, your c is actually 0, excuse me, 0. So h is equal to negative b, which is negative negative 10, over 2a, which is 2 times 1, which is positive 10 over 2, which is 5. The k, how much room do I have? Just enough. The k, you plug that in. So f of 5 would be 5 squared minus 10 times 5 which is 25 minus 50, which is negative 25. So the point of this problem was to find two numbers that have a difference of 10 that when you multiply them, it makes a really small answer. And if you think the answers are five and negative 25, you're blatantly wrong because guess what? those two numbers don't have a difference of 10. They have a difference of 30. Those are not the answers. One of them is an answer, the other is not. This right here is a location of a vertex. This right here is the max or min, in this case, the min. This is the min value, not one of the numbers. See, the numbers or what x and y represent. <coughs> The h was the x value of that problem. h is x. That's the x value of the minimum, x being the first number here. So the first number is the 5. That was the h which is the x value from the vertex. And this is why I said we prefer to solve it for y. If you solve for x, this equation is going to be in y's. It ends up being y squared minus 10y. But then you might think you're supposed to take the k, but you're not. It's just you have y's here where really conceptually they should be x's. It's just a weird thing to have to be careful of. So the first number is 5. How do you find the second number? Well. The second number was y, and we said that y is x minus 10. That's why I put double asterisks next to that, because we were going to come back to it. So the second number is just the x minus 10, which is 5 minus 10, which is negative 5. 5 and negative 5 do have a difference of 10, and their product is negative 25. So the answer is 5 and negative five, that is not a coordinate. Those are two numbers. Like I said, this is kind of a boring problem. It's a little pure mathematical, but there are absolutely ways that we could turn this into something with more application. But I like to do a pure math problem and then an application problem just to kind of give you an idea of how both worlds work. Because there's plenty of use for pure mathematics, but there's also plenty of use for applied. So let's get into the applied side of things. So again, what's the process? You're probably going to end up with a primary and a secondary equation. The secondary one will have a direct number in it. The primary is the thing you're trying to find the max or min of. Use x's and y's. Take your secondary equation, solve it for y, then plug it into the other one, the primary, and then just find its vertex. But the thing is, the vertex is usually not the answer. It usually has one of the answers and then just another piece of information. That's right, I have some of this typed up already. That's nice. So example five. We plan on building a rectangular garden on the side of a house. We go to Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever and we buy 120 feet of fence. And we go, we're not going back. Our buddy with the trailer's already left. So we're not going back. We got 120 feet of fence, that's it. What dimensions would maximize the area of this garden? 
And then what is the maximum area? So we're trying to build a garden as large as possible with as few materials as possible. We're trying to make the most of our money here, essentially. But we also want to have the biggest garden possible so we can get the most vegetables, whatever. You could do the same thing with like a horse pen. You want your animals to have as much roaming area as possible. You can also have a problem similar to this where you put a divider in there so you got horses on one side and pigs on another maybe. <laughs> But this is a pretty applicable problem. And you might say, well, why do you need to know the maximum area? Well, when you go and buy soil nutrients, uh, those bags are usually labeled based on how many square feet or square inches you've got. So that would be a reason to need to know the maximum area. That way, in case you go back with your car to go get the soil and stuff, you know how many bags to buy. But yeah, don't scroll. Don't scroll. That's right. So we're going to build a rectangular garden on the side of the house. Why are we going to build it on the side of a house? Well, let me show you. Here's our house from a top-down view. So we're staring at the roof. And then here in red will be our garden. <clears throat> when we build a garden or a pen or whatever to the side of another building, you don't need to fence the side that's attached to the house because the house is going to keep it from escaping. <clears throat> your tomatoes aren't just going to go through the house, right? I know that was a weird way to say it, but what can you say? I'm weird. So here is our fence. The red is our fence. Now, very clearly, once again, you don't need to fence this side. That would just be silly. You'd be wasting material. So you can have a bigger pen by only fencing three sides. Now, when you do it this way, two of the sides will have to be the same length. And then the other side can be, I would say, whatever, but it will be determined. Now, I want to make sure that based on the work I already have typed up, I have two L's. So I'm going to call this the length, which makes this also the length, and this one we'll call the width. And I'm going to give them letters of L and W, which I think makes sense. If you prefer to give them X and Y, no one will care as long as you say that length is X and width is Y or vice versa. <clears throat> Again, I could call them width, width, and length. At the end of the problem, the numbers will match. It's just your algebra will look backwards until the end. So we are just focused on this segment right here. We don't care about the house at all anymore. We're just worried about that. Just this area. And by area, I mean just this part of the problem, not literal area. However, we will be doing literal area too. So that's what we're focusing on. Now, we're dealing with a rectangle, even though it's not completed. Rectangles have lengths and they have perimeters. So that would probably be a really good idea to use for your primary and secondary equation. The 120 feet of fencing, this is going to be related to the perimeter. That doesn't look like a P, does it? And I'm going to put it in quotes because it's not a true rectangular perimeter because we don't have the fourth side. So we don't have this extra width, it's just two lengths and a single width. That's what we'll uh, make the 120 feet of fence out of. But then we're trying to maximize the area, so we should also use the area of a rectangle. Now, even though, even though this isn't fenced, it doesn't change the area of that rectangle at all. And the area of a rectangle, you better know, is length times width. So we can see that area is length times width. And then what you see here, Ignore this for just a second. L plus L plus W equals 120. That's the perimeter uh, that I'm doing right here. This is the quote perimeter. And L plus L would be 2L. <clears throat> So we get 2L plus W equals 120. This is what I would call our secondary equation. That is our secondary equation. This area equals length times width. We can rewrite A equals L times W. Without using big words. <clears throat> but we don't know what the area is. That's the thing we're trying to find the maximum of. 
So we had the number for the perimeter, that was the 120, which made it the secondary, which makes the A equals L plus W, sorry, L times W, that's the primary. So what do we do? We stuff the secondary inside of the primary. Now you might say, well, which should I solve for, L or W? It doesn't matter because they're not gonna have that X and Y confusion here. Me personally, I would solve for W because W is gonna be easier to solve for in this equation. All you have to do is move the 2L. If you try to solve for L, you'd have to move the W and the 2. So I'm just gonna take 2L plus W equals 120. I'm gonna subtract 2L on both sides. Um, and I don't, oh, it's right here. So we took this, we subtracted 2L on both sides, and we got our secondary equation. So we take this, and we're gonna plug it in for W. Why W? Because it says W equals. <coughs> So when we do that, instead of having A equals L times W, we get A equals L times 120 minus 2L. And I'm using the word area, I can use the letter A, nobody cares which way you do it. You can actually use function notation. This is an A of L if you wanted to write it as a function because L is the variable seen, so it's dependent on L. That's not A times L, that's A of L. I know most people don't do it, except when they're using X's and Y's and F's, because it looks confusing. I get it. All right, so what do we do from here? We distribute, because we're trying to find the vertex. That's our goal, because we're trying to ma maximize or minimize this thing. You can't find the vertex in this format. You might say, oh, this isn't this vertex form? No, this is not vertex form, because this thing isn't being squared. This L is inside, and it, I'm sorry, this L is outside, and it should be inside arguably. So we distribute, and that's going to give us that the area is equal to 120L minus 2L squared. That's A equals 120 minus 2L squared. I know it looks a little funny. Or A equals negative 2L squared plus 120L. I missed the L here. There we go. I'm just put this, I just swap the two terms so I have the square term first. That way we won't accidentally misidentify our A or B. And then we find the vertex. And I don't have the math shown for that. Spoiler alert. So H is the X coordinate of the vertex, which will be one of the links or widths. That's the negative B over 2A, which is negative 120 over 2 times negative 2. That's negative 120 over negative 4. The negatives cancel. 4 goes into 12 three times, so that's 30. Now this H relates to whatever variable we were seeing in the area problem. So this H relates to the L, so it's the length. So the length is equal to... 30 feet, units are critical. 30 inches, 30 miles, no, 30 feet. If you go ahead and find the K, well, the K is just plug in the H value, so F of 30, which is negative two times 30 squared plus 120 times 30. 3 squared is 9. Just uh, put another 0, so that's 900. 900 times uh, 2 is 1,800, so that's negative 1,800. 12 times 3 is 36. Just tag on those two zeros, so that's plus 3,600, which when you add those, you get positive 1,800. Now, if you think this is the width, that would not even be possible because we only had 120 feet of fence. So how is the width 1,880, I'm sorry, 1,800 feet? So that's not possible for it to be the width. Remember that the K, the output is the maximum thing. And the equation we were relating this was the area. So this is the max area. Now you might say, well, how do you know it's not a min? We know it's a max because the A is negative. So it has to point down, making it a max. Now, 1,800 feet, question mark? Actually, that's wrong. Area is measured in square units because you're taking feet times feet, which is feet squared. 
So you're thinking, okay, we know the length, we know the area, what about the width? How do you find the width? Mr. Beckner, tell me how do you find the width? Well, we had an equation right here that said the width is blah, 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 blah. So just plug in the number we knew for the length, which we got to be 30. So now we can say the width is W equals 120 minus two times 30, which is 60, 120 minus 60 is 60. Width is in feet. So we have a 30 foot by 60 foot garden with a max area of 1800 square feet. And check this out, if you multiply 30 and 60, you get 1800. Three times six is 18, two zeros makes 1800. I am telling you, applications of surface area, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say surface area. I mean, it's, it is the same thing, but area and perimeter. Usually we say surface area when we're dealing with three-dimensional shapes, surface area versus volume. So applications of area versus perimeter and maximizing things or minimizing things, lots of people do this all the time. Now, they may not do all the algebra. They may just have little spreadsheets with values already set up for themselves. But this concept is extremely important. And it's not something that's going to go away if you're going to calculus. I will, I will say this is not something we're going to do over and over and over in this course. But you will see this again. You'll be tested on it. But it's not going to come up again in chapter four. It's not really going to creep up in chapter three again. But it is a great concept. I love this type of application problem. And I can change this by saying, all right, well, maybe you're, you've got a house here. I'm just going to get a little weird with it for a second. Maybe you got a house here, and you got a barn somewhere over here, and you're just going to fence between them. And you go, oh, OK, well, Maybe you can actually move the barn. You're going to decide where to place the barn, and then you've just got, you know, a channel here and here. Or maybe you've got animals going from one place to another. You know, you can do this all kinds of ways. Maybe you don't attach that garden to the house. Maybe you put a divider in it. Maybe you put three dividers in it, and that changes the perimeter up quite a bit, but the area never actually changes. But because the perimeter is changing, it makes that 30 versus 60 ratio change. Um, maybe it's like uh, 30 by 45 instead. Maybe it's 60 by 60, which it would be if it was, uh, if it was off by itself. If it wasn't attached to the house, the dimensions would, wouldn't be the same. All righty. So that is 3.1. That homework date has already been set as a week from today. But we do have about 15 minutes left, so we're going to dive headfirst into 3.2. Polynomial functions in their graphs. So 3.1 was on quadratic functions in their graphs, which we call parabolas. 3.2, we're going to open it up even more to polynomials. So things with x to the third, x to the fourth, x to the fifth. No square roots, no fractions with variables in the bottoms. Um, none of that goofy stuff. Just things like x to the fourth plus x to the third plus x squared plus x plus one, but with coefficients as well. Now, this big set of instructions is known as the leading coefficient test. We call it the leading coefficient test because we're only going to look at the leading term. But before we get there, uh, this whole C board thing, this is my board, so. <laughs> to determine the end behavior of a polynomial of the form, so of that form is f of x equals do, 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 a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1 plus a sub n minus 2 times x to the n minus 2 plus blah 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 then a sub 2 x squared plus a sub 1 x plus a sub 0. This is what we call a generalized polynomial. It looks like a bunch of nonsense, I know. Here's the facts. 
each of these little a sub i's, i just means any of the n or n minus one or n minus two or two or one or three or five or 12 or whatever. These are the coefficients. Coefficients. And then the x to a whatever is just your variable being raised to a specific power. And the little n just tells us which coefficient it is. So this is the coefficient of the thing that's to the nth power. This is the coefficient of the thing with the n minus one power. When you actually have problems, there's no n's. It's like an x to the five, x to the four, x to the three, something like that. So n is just the largest exponent, which means it is the degree of the polynomial. It's also the degree of that single term, but it's more generalized as the degree of the polynomial. So when we talk about the biggest uh, exponent term as an x cubed, that's a cubic. It's a third degree polynomial. When we talk about the biggest exponent being a two, that's a quadratic. It's a second degree polynomial. If, the x to the if there's an x to the 10th and there's no number bigger than 10 as an exponent somewhere, it's a 10th degree polynomial. And that n plays a critical role. So here's what you do. When you have all these 30, 40, 50 terms, maybe, don't worry, it's usually no more than four or five for us. Whoops, I thought I had highlighter. Highlight, please, and thank you. That's the only term you need. For the leading coefficient test to determine your end behavior, you don't look at anything except for the leading term. That's all you do. You just look at the leading term. So a sub n times x to the n is the leading term. So it has a leading coefficient, which would be the a sub n. Again, don't let all the little n's and n minus ones throw you off. I'm just saying, all right, if this is an x to the 10th, that means n is 10, then you have an, a nine, n minus one, sorry, n minus one, which is nine, n minus two, which is eight, n minus three, which is seven, n minus six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Some of those terms may be missing because some of the coefficients could be zero. But again, all we're doing is looking at this term for the leading coefficient test, which is, if you're in, in other words, if the biggest exponent is even, you're under one of two cases. So this is a, if this, then that, if this, then that kind of thing. So if your biggest exponent is even, if the leading coefficient is positive, both ends point up. So in other words, we have no idea what happens in the middle of the function, but we know the far left and the far right are going to point up. If your leading coefficient is negative, both ends point down. So what I'm saying is we don't have any clue what the middle part of the function looks like, but we know that the far left and far right sides are going to point down. And I'm not saying they have this steepness. They may just pretty much point straight down. So again, when, when, what I'm talking about here is maybe your middle of the function looks something like this. This is the middle. That's what I'm talking about. Here's your middle, but then the ends both point down. We are not worrying about the inside yet. We're just worrying about really, 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 really large x values. So like what happens at x equals 100 and negative 100, at 1,000 and negative 1,000 all the weird kind of bumps along the way stop becoming an issue. And that leading term is gonna start taking over the growth. Because with the biggest exponent, when you plug in five or a thousand or 10,000, that's gonna become the largest number. It's gonna basically take over. And again, once you get to the hundreds and the thousands, all these other terms barely have an effect, have an effect versus the leading term. All right, so that's the even case. Both ends point in the same directions. If your n is odd, however, they're gonna point in different directions. If the leading coefficient is positive, then the left end goes up and the right end goes down. So again, we'll have this big section where we don't know what happens, but if your leading co fo coefficient is positive, that means the right goes up and the left goes down. Vice versa, if your leading coefficient is negative, the left goes down, Excuse me, I said that wrong. I was looking at the other one. The left goes up and the right goes down. We still have no idea what happens in the middle. We'll figure that out later. 
but this is the greatest way to start out graphing a polynomial, just to know what happens at the extremes. Now you might say, good Lord, Mr. Beckner, why have I got to memorize all these little if this, then that, if this, then that? Well, first of all, the even versus odd makes it a little easier because the even cases point in the same direction. The odds do not. Positive coefficients point up, negative coefficients point down for evens. I think that makes sense just based on uh, reflections. We Like with our x squared graph, we always pointed it up unless there was a vertical reflection. Well, a negative in front of the leading term is a vertical reflection. It's the odd case that people mess up more than anything else. But I'm going to give you an amazing way to remember this. All the words, all the words I just had you handwrite, type, however you're doing this, that is not how I do this at all. It helps me paint these pictures, but what I'm gonna do is, and, and again, I want you to write that <laughs> because this is all true, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare this to the graphs of x squared and x cubed, which x squared is the first even exponent polynomial, and x cubed is the first odd exponent nonlinear polynomial. But even with linear ones, the left goes and right goes case is still the same. So this is what I'm looking at, x squared, positive x squared, both ends go up, and you're supposed to have that memorized whereas negative x squared would be a vertical reflection, so both ends go down. Look at these two things versus these two things. If you ignore the section in the middle, if you cut out all of that, it's the exact same thing. So, I never memorized all of this, if this, then that, if this, then that. I memorized the basic graphs of x squared and x cubed, and then I just cut out the middleman, and I know exactly what's going to happen. Let's look at positive x cubed, which again, you were supposed to have memorized that the right end goes up like this, and the left end goes down like that. And negative x cubed, which is just a vertical reflection, so left goes up and right goes down. Compare this to these. When the leading coefficient's positive, this is positive, left, down, right, up. When it's negative, left, up, right, down. So again, if you just take your basic x cubed graph, cut out the middle, whether it uh, has a reflection or not, you get those shapes. You get the same shapes. I love borrowed information that we already understand versus blatant memorization of new things that might not have any sense or reasoning to them. You are already supposed to have memorized the x squared and x cubed graphs. You're already supposed to know how to do vertical reflections. So this is old stuff that again, all you do is cut the middle section out and you get the whole, all right, if your exponent's even, if it's a positive coefficient, both up. If it's negative, both down. If your exponent's odd, if the leading coefficient's positive, right and up, left and down, vice versa, left and up, right and down. There we go. These graphs, we are not done with either in that kind of helpful comparison where just these four pictures, honestly, only two of them are really necessary for the next thing, are going to tell us something else. So we're gonna start talking about how our intercepts sometimes bounce, and sometimes they cross. That is a feature that can 100% be detailed based on the x squared and x cubed graphs as well. However, I will give you blatant sentences, you know, if this, then that, if this, then that, but once again, they will completely tie in to these two pictures. And again, the way my brain works, my brain is not great at just blatant memorization of facts, which is why I would never be a doctor because I would never survive anatomy. But if you give me A to B to C to D to E to F to blah, 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 to Z to capital A to capital B, I can follow a logic trail. And that is what I try to teach at this level because logic trails at this level are important, not just blatant memorizations. 
So we only have a couple minutes left. I don't even know if I have time to write out the example and, and complete it. Uh, it would only be one or the other. So we're going to call it a day there. We will apply all of this next class, minus the bouncing and crossing immediately. But for now, I know no one's going to focus on this. I know you're all going to focus on the chapter two, the last one or two homeworks, the review, the test, and that's what you should be doing for the next couple of days. So you've got all of today, all of tomorrow, 11.59 p.m. due date. Remember, the test is in the quiz and test section. The review is in the homework section immediately under the chapter two homework. There's also the PDF version in Canvas if you want something you know, a little more old school. And then remember that you have to submit your work in Canvas. I already made that available. If for some reason there's any technical issues with it, please email me and let me know and I'll get it fixed ASAP. Uh, but I believe I got it right the first time. So have a good day, have a good weekend. Don't stress, study hard, learn, regurgitate the material, make A's and B's, and we'll see you on Monday. Have a good day, everyone. Take care.